Welcome to season two of the Shopstool podcast, a podcast for woodworkers and the maker community in general. With Joey Chalk from King Post Timberworks, Brian Cush from Sawdust Bureau, and Robin Lewis from Robin Lewis Makes. Hi everyone, I hope you're all good. This is episode eight. No, no, it's not, it's episode nine. Hi everyone, I hope you're all good. This is episode nine, season two of the Shopstool podcast. As always, I want to start by introducing my two co-hosts. Joey, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad. Good. And Brian, how are you today? I'm very good. Thanks, Rob. That's good. And my name is Robin Lewis. Welcome back to the show, everyone. So today we're going to start off with a, another quote-unquote Joey story, which we've heard <laughs> about in the past. Uh, but we're going to elaborate on this a little bit just to, to expand on that um, instead of it just being just being a rant, although talking to Joey earlier on today, I think the, 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 the therapy session is now in <laughs> progress, so it's time to get off your chest. So, so Joey, yeah, what happened? Okay, so I wanted to talk this episode about knock-on effects of changes when, when clients make changes for whatever reason, often the smallest change can be just a bit of a nightmare for whatever reason. Um, in this case particularly, it's complete, I mean, it's ridiculous how stupid this is. <laughs> like, okay, so um, this, this job has been in the pipeline for a while. And it, 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 it's um, an Australian couple have bought this tiny little double garage type size uh, building in Auckland. And they've had a builder in there converting it out to be their little um, holiday type house when they fly over here. They, they seem to come over pretty regularly for work and such. So it made more sense for them to have like their own little base. So you've got a, a, like a one room kind of studio and they wanted me to fit it out with all the cabinetry and everything they needed, a little mini kitchen, just general storage and stuff you could imagine what needs to happen in, in a little place. Um, so I went to measure up just before the, the jib was going on. This is weeks, this is like eight weeks ago. And so the last week, I emailed the client as I do to say, hey, look, I'm about to start your work, just letting you know I've got the materials and tomorrow I'm going to get into making, start making the cabinets. Um, and I hear something, she, she emails me back about uh, some questions I had about the sink and paint color, things like that. No, I, nothing that would nothing that would make you concerned or no. <laughs> pause the build. Okay, yeah. And then I called the builder for some reason. I just had this niggling feeling I should call the builder, and he's like, "Oh yeah, nothing has happened on site since you last saw it. It's it's still nothing." And I'm like, "What do you mean? Like, what? <laughs> it's just ridiculous." And so it turns out they had this issue with a, one of the foundation walls. Had, didn't have a foundation under it on one side of this building and they've had oh, to go geez. get engineers to do things they're going to have to undermine the building and you know put a big footing under one side of it long story short I mean they've only just um, submitted some plans to council about a week ago and there's a minimum kind of 21 day turnaround and then the builder's got to get there do the work nothing's happening before Christmas there's no way my part of the job's going to be ready before Christmas and I'm like, so I'm straight on the phone to the owner saying, so what, what's going to happen exactly? I've started making these cabinets. Why didn't you tell me last week when I said I was about to start them that you're no way near ready for them to be yeah. installed? Like, I said, what are you going to do now? You've got, I've got all these carcasses sitting in my workshop. Uh, you've got a couple of op options. You can pay me $100 a week and I'll keep them in the corner of my workshop. Um, and then some indefinite time um, or if you've got somewhere to store it uh, I'll carry on and we'll store it and then when it, the build's actually finished I'll come and install it again um, and she was like oh I thought I thought it would just I didn't think you'd make them that quickly and you'd you'd have them ready by the time everything's finished <laughs> like what in three months like <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I, I was just like blown away at like the I don't want to say ignorance but like um just lack of forethought or, or anything in, in it. Uh, so there's knowledge. no way that she could have misunderstood what you what your role was. It, it, do you know what I mean? Is there no way she could have got it wrong based on 
what you were, what you'd s- said. Not, no, and, and not saying that you did something wrong, but she misread the the situation. Is there no way she could have done that? Well, I don't know, man. I mean, she knows that the building has not had anything done on it since I was there on site. <laughs> they they probably could have told me, hey, we've got we've had a delay. You might want to not make all our stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like it seems obvious. I she seemed to think that I had. She, Okay, she did seem to think that I had some giant warehouse and I could just store it in here. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I do have a, a warehouse, but I also have other jobs. Like, we we have only so much space. Um, so it was just I was just so kind of blown away at the, just the complete lack of any thought. And I think it's because she's mainly living in Australia. And they don't really, they don't see it every day. It's not something that's in the front of their head. Mm. But that's kind of not my problem. <laughs> um, yeah. So what, what did she end up going with? What's, what's going to happen? I, no idea. I said, look, you've got to Monday to make a decision. And then I'm going to start billing you at least for storing these boxes. I said, if you had told me last week not that you weren't ready, I would have just left the sheets of plywood standing up against the wall and just not touched mm. them, I would have been fine. But now I've made three-dimensional stuff that's got to go somewhere. And, um, you know, yes. not fun. So yeah, I've I, just, think I'm, I think I'm just going to go and he- add some uh, small print into my contracts with clients now about storage costs. I've had similar issues, but I've been in a position where I have an adjacent building that I could use to store right. them in, which was great. But I had two jobs in a row that were going into an apartment. Um, One of the apartments was held up by a a building control issue. It was nine months late, and the other one was seven seven months late. So it was it was kind of it was kind of fine because I just stuck them into a space that I had a bit of a gallery set up in, and you know it's just another space space another piece to show other clients. Yeah, but. If I didn't have that space, it's like, who's it, who's it on to pay the storage costs? Like, when I don't have a contract with them, do I say, do I need to put it in in my uh, terms and conditions? I think I probably do. Well, yeah, I mean, that's probably a good idea. And on the other hand, I think you could, you, there's a fair amount of, like, if it's not in the contract anyway, it's yeah. something that's like, well, I've got this thing, you're not ready for it, either rent a storage space yourself or Mm. you're going to pay me for my storage space i'd much rather it not be in my workshop because inevitably it just gets smashed into yeah Mm. especially Uh, when they're large joinery pieces they're not yeah these are not a couple of bedside tables i had i had a client store uh, a vanity for seven months like that's similar to you brian and that one was small enough that I could just kind of put a blanket over it, sit it in the corner, and it kind of only got in the way when I really wanted to use the joiner. Otherwise, um, it was all right. But, I mean, this is like a house lot of cabinets, just carcasses. And I'm like, this is actually, I could stack them up and they'll go up to the ceiling and kind of make this big kind of pyramid of boxes. But it's just yes. like, it's just so stupid. <laughs> It's quite funny when we talked, because we, we touched on this briefly last season, I remember, and I was, while we were talking about that, I just thought, I can see it would be a problem, hypothetically, but, you know, how often can this really happen? Yeah. How, how, how much of a problem can this actually be? So it's quite interesting, Brian, to hear that, that you've had similar issues. Like I said, haven't been quite as big an issue for me because I've had a space that I can store things in. But uh, I've had issues with getting pieces into clients' homes, which is uh, probably one of the most soul-destroying things I've had to deal with. Actually Um, getting it in the door. Getting it in the door. And uh, I'm not talking about the ground floor house kind of door. I'm talking about like a sixth floor office building where it had to go up a winding stair with a lift in the middle made it through all the flights up until the top floor, which is where their entry was. Their door was offset versus all the other doors down below. Oh, no. So it, it just, it, you couldn't get the swing angle on the table to get it in. So it resulted, sorry about the audio here, by the way, we're just having a nice storm in Melbourne. <laughs> oh, is that rain? Um, yeah, yeah, oh, of course it's rain, it's Melbourne. Um, so yeah, it ended up, uh, and it was a steel frame table with a timber top on it a large kind of counter height bench that they were using as an island and it 
basically involved having to come back that evening whilst all the other officers had, had vacated and taking an angle grinder to a stringer section. Um, this is while it's just left blocking a, a fire stair, which is obviously <laughs> yeah. not fantastic. A bit of a no-no. <laughs> Removing the uh, steel stringer from it and then taking it back to my workshop, making a template uh, timber brace that would brace it back on that I could bolt through and uh yeah delivering that the next day i mean the extra hours involved in that the two like the two trips to get it back um i reckon that was probably about another 10 hours did you make so do you think you made any money with that extra work no that was my profit gone so your profit was gone yeah 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 Yeah. most of my profit was gone um they kind of hinted that, it, I mean, they had done the measure. I always say to clients, I'll, you know, if you want to pay me, I'll come out and do the measure. And I mean, probably about 10% of clients are happy with that. But now I'm definitely a little bit stricter on that. Um, I do invoice clients if that happens. Uh, these guys, I kind of got the sense that they were happy to pay something. And then after I came back, and again, this is on a 35 degree humid Melbourne afternoon, dripping in sweat. <laughs> And they handed me a six pack of beer to say thank you, and I'm like, Oh my god! I mean, <laughs> make it a slab Australian or something, you know, but, but still, yeah, <laughs> either give nothing count. or give something worthwhile. But yeah, a six pack of beer was was pretty tough to take. I would be taking their beers and then giving them my invoice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and a similar a similar thing actually happened recently with an, a similar design table. It was an island bench. So this is one thing you've got to really watch out with. Anything bigger than a dining table height is your door width. So you got to you know anybody out there doing a counter at the minute, just think about the offset of your legs to any stringers, horizontal stringers along the bottom. Yeah. Seven twenty door. If you've got a nine fifty bench, it ain't gonna fit when it's on its side. So yeah, I know it, that design now. I um, have the stringer as a removable section that bolts on for every job, regardless yeah. of where it's going. Uh, but yeah, these. This couple were architects. They'd measured it. They'd modelled it. They'd sent me a CAD model. You know, I was able to rotate the the table on the side, and it showed it going in. And then I get on site, and their measurements are out by like sixty mil here and eighty mil here. And oh I'm my like, god! Yeah, you're architects. Um, so they got invoiced yeah. for it. Um, but that was again a steel frame that you have to take an angle grinder to. It's been powder coated. It's it's just such small things that can save a job. Um, and yeah, now altering the design of that has been a response and it's going to make my life easier from now on. Now that first job, would you, because that sounds like it's the customer's mistake, so surely you wouldn't be, or is, is that just one of those gray areas that you just, you work It's in? a bit gray, yeah. huh? It's a gray area. Uh, Especially I was probably about just... a year and a half into my business. Yeah. Um, these guys were the next door neighbors to a very reputable architects in Melbourne that I was hoping to sort of get in with and you don't want to just be that guy that is the guy that you know charged them an exorbitant amount to fix their yeah. mistake so mm. I was kind of doing it on the sly hoping I'd get some work out of it and uh, no, never got any more work out of them <laughs> that's always the way eh? yeah. talking about getting furniture through that those sort of spaces. I was watching on the block last night, which is in Melbourne. They were craning in a table, and I presume that they're craning it in because they can't get it up the stairs or up through mm-hmm. the, the space. Is that a normal thing to do? Apartment buildings are notoriously bad. When I worked as an architect, some of the changes that developers would make around stairwells and hallways, I mean, you just can't. You can't do it. Um, you, could, you couldn't even get a medium-sized couch in a lot of these, these apartments mm. if, if they were built that way. Uh, the second apartment that I was referring to, where it was the architect couple, their loading dock um, involved, I think it was 1,100 mil wide, down three flights of stairs, <laughs> and, and a door that opened outwards. <laughs> you, you couldn't get anything through it. So they've, they've gone to the effort to assign this space as a loading dock, and then everything has to be taken from the car park, down the side street, out through the front foyer. It's madness. It's madness. So, yeah, it is a really common occurrence, especially in, wow. in cities, Melbourne, yeah, Sydney, well, Notorious. And when you think about generally in the high-rises and, and kind of 
any buildings with offices in it as well, they all want mm -hmm. conference tables. Then, yeah. And you, there's so many um, videos on Instagram with these guys, like teams of guys after hours trying to manhandle, you know, like yep. a five meter long table up somewhere that's not designed for anything like that. Yeah. Do either of you follow um, Matthias Pleisnig? I think a pr probably an awful pronunciation, but he's a New York based. I think he's no. Danish origin mm -hmm. and he does steam bent benches, these beautiful okay. organic benches. His workshop is first story in, I think it's Brooklyn. And these pieces are enormous. They're like 10 to 15 meters long. What? And they have to be craned out. They take a window out and the crane comes and they close off the street and pull these things out. It's amazing. If you go on his Instagram and have a look, Matthias Pleisnig. What's the last um, name? Pleisnig. I'll try to get a spelling for you. Um, you have to come back to me on that one. So yeah, he's craning them out and then they're being craned in to an apartment or something at the other end. So then you would just have to, you would assume then that if you're the type of person who's buying that sort of furniture, the cost of that, of the crane high, all of that, that's negligible. I am, yeah, I am oh, so wealthy that that's yeah. irrelevant. I think as well, it's, it's the, like his pieces, you know, I would yeah. assume are somewhere in the forty to $50,000 range for a basic one. Mm. When you're adding on that extra fee, it's a pretty small percentage. This is something that I've had as well with pieces when I've been sending them. Um, like if it's a small set of bedside tables, but I mean, they're still taking up a reasonable volume versus an expensive bench. The perception of that, the value yeah. to ship an item, you know, yeah. I'm never going to send those bedside tables internationally, whereas the bench, people will pay a bit more to, to yeah. ship it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I was interested in what you were saying before, Brian. Um, can you clarify what you were talking about as your time to measure up? You, you said uh, if they're willing to pay for me to I come will come and measure. measure. If it's a house, I'll measure the space. I'll, I'll, um, if it's a dining table or something like that, I'll mask out the dining table in oh, the space okay. to show them right. the size of it. Right. I'll then measure the entrance into the space to, again, calculate... Yep. widths and, and swing angles to get around nibs and things like that to make sure that the table will definitely fit in the space yeah. so yeah it's a twofold thing it's showing yeah, it's trying to offer them idea. some kind of visualization yep. because i still find that if i i produce cad models and show them renders yep. in the space but until you actually tape it out on the ground and they see that it is this big they, they might want to make it you know s some small adjustments to it yeah i've never um i've never ask a client if they wanted me to do that for like a freestanding piece like a table but I will always say I always ask them is there access is there like a set of French doors um, or if we are just coming through a, a single door then we need to then do some serious um, measurements but if you've got and a lot, of those, a lot of the times here there's opening double doors into a dining area from a deck or something um, mm. what, what they never tell you is the access to the deck is always horrendous. Like it's, it's, there's, it's always through a garden behind the house, up through a hedge and then onto the deck and then you're fine, but getting it to that point. <laughs> what kind of percentage of your work would end up in residential houses instead of apartments, Joy? Um, 99. See, I'd, I'd probably be about 80, 20 apartments. Well, 80% <laughs> apartments. Yeah. So yeah, I, again, it's one of those things you're talking about um, maybe adding things in terms and conditions into a contract you know maybe as a community we should be better at putting in things like if there's no access and we can't get this piece in i mean what is what is the outcome if we need to store it what is what is the payment for that i guess you know this kind of brings up for me something that we essentially we're talking about at the start is, is knock on effects there are so many small things that a client can have the uh, can make changes to that completely change like, for example, if a client says, I want a, a satin clear coat on my table, fine. And then, like, a week before delivery, they say, oh, actually, I've been, I've been looking at all these other tables and now I want a gloss finish. Like, okay. So, you know, I might not have a gloss compatible... Well, they're not... They're, one, there might not be a gloss version of the product I used. So then you go, okay, we need got to find something compatible, we've got to do some tests, plus the extra time and all that. They think we can just say, oh, yeah, I'll just go and put some gloss on it and it'll be fine. 
but actually, you know, you've got to do time to research, buy the new product, which you probably have to buy a minimum of like whatever it is, two liters or something. You've got all this extra there. And then maybe you have to do some experiments to see if there's compatibility issues. Uh, maybe generally with gloss, you probably want to spray it rather than any other kind of finish. So that, that could be something you can't do necessarily with the product type. And, and there's all these knock-on issues that compound and suddenly you just say, okay, we can do gloss, but it's going to be an extra 1500 bucks by the time I actually yeah. get that to you. And then, but oh a, client, a, client's, a client's perception of that would be, oh, it's just a matter of changing to, it's, it's going to be a hundred bucks or something. That's, but that's yeah, right. the knock-on costs are astronomical. And it's just this, and but what I, because you say about adding something to the clause of your contract, for me, it's like there's too many things to even start adding things to a contract. You could, you could start, you could put so many things in there that the client says, uh, I'm just put off by the amount of, of clauses in the contract. Yeah, because you don't want to be, come off as this, this dictator. Um, who's all militaristic yeah. about it and saying it's got to be done this because you're just going to scare people away with that type of language. I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's worth at some point in your, in your planning process or even in the, the build process, you, or, and, and this might be in the, con- in the contract, you have a date where no changes can be made. At that point, no more changes can be made. Yeah, so the way I gauge that at the moment is... Generally, I can tell straight away if the client comes back to me with lots of changes to the to the drawings. If, if that happens like twice after I send drawings, then I say, okay, any more changes up to this point, you're going to have to start paying for new drawings. And then, and and also, I will say, and once I start, once I tell you, I've started making something. There's no nothing changes, and that includes nothing. the finish, that type of thing. Yeah, I, I'll just say you can pay me all the money in the world, nothing's changing on this now mm. uh, because we're locked in because what, what I do on day one is affecting what happens on the last day of the job. Yeah. So, um, it's, even, it's even pre that. It's even buying materials, something like yeah. that. So especially for you, buying sheets of plywood yeah. and getting them delivered all as one. But if they change a design that requires an extra 500 mil strip of plywood, that involves you <laughs> ordering a new sheet, the delivery costs, the handling charges. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Well, I just, I mean, just had that. Um, I've got this pretty cool job. We're doing a, a whole lot of ash kind of cabinetry and furniture built into a, a renovation in a, on a house. And so I'm using a lot of ash veneer on plywood. And so I've got to get that specially pressed. And they just gave me the deposits. And I said, right, I'm ordering these 11 sheets. Um, I'm ordering it today. That's it. Like, there's no more. If you want to add anything, you know, there's, there's no way it's happening at the same time. And there may be variances in the quality and stuff. If, if we get it all at the same time, you're going to get like one batch. Um, but if you start adding and t- subtracting things, that's when the job's going to start looking really, you know, who knows what happens. Um, and, yeah. Uh, it's fr- I imagine it's pretty frustrating. We can hear your heart breaking. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, in good news, I see you're not doing only cabinetry at the moment, Joey. I saw oh, man. on Instagram a table. Uh, I'm starting a table. <laughs> this was the day that the lady talked to me about this stuff, not her house not being ready for the cabinetry. I just like shoved it all to the side and I picked up these bits of walnut and said, I'm going to make a table. It's, I've jumped it ahead a couple in the queue just because I was like, well, I've got a day. I'm just going to start smashing out the tabletop. Yeah. And it's been really nice to just kind of turn off the computer, turn off the phone, and just I just worked on that like like a crazy man for one day. And it got heaps done on a, you know, milled, milling through to fitting up one breadboard end in a day. So um, that was a, yeah, wow. a, a good effort. Is there anything fancy about the table or is it just a, a pretty straightforward? It's interesting. Um, Interesting, the lady is American and she lives here now and she had friends in Canada. She really liked their table, so she took like exact dimensions of it and lots of pictures and stuff. And then I drew it up to her. She wanted to scale it up a little bit. And she's like, oh, you know, it actually doesn't look that good. So I came up with a few other options. And so now we've gone for a slightly more Japanese feel, some angled legs. And um, so it's going to be kind of like a... A pedestal table with like split like a split leg pedestal mm-hmm. it's kind of a, a strange 
design. So, um, yeah, and she's very specific about the size of it so she can get her chairs around it. And um, it's going to be quite an interesting. It's very simple but kind of complex. Mm. So um, hopefully I can finish that next week. Yeah, well, it's the, the breadboard looked pretty pretty tight. Yeah, I'm just having a couple of issues getting the other one, other end done just before we start, started the podcast. But uh, I think um, a big fat clamp shall help things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, what are you guys up to? Brian, what have you been working on? Uh, I'm still working on my island bench and wine rack and a set of stools. Mm. Um, I'm about to start on a couple of... I've got a, a design called Ply Parasite. It's one of the only pieces I do in plywood. Mm. It's like edge laminated plywood strips. A uh, pair of those, bedside tables, and a dining table for my brother-in-law. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah, yet to is be that, designed. I was going to say, is that free... You get free uh, choice of, of what happens with that, or...? It's kind of the rule with uh, yeah family price projects is that yeah. this needs to be something that I design. You can give me yeah. the dimensions, yeah. but I design this and you take it how it is. That's cool. <laughs> it that's, becomes that's a, really cool. a prototype piece for me to potentially sell again. Yeah, I like that. I like when you get free range over what happens. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, this this week I've been um, I'm working on I'm still working on that steam band chair which I've been doing for the last mm. couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a funny story. So I've got 11 of these slats to bend, right? And I start. I had all my, my piles of timber. So it's, it's two Vic Ash and one Merbau. Um, so three slats, put them into the steamer, pull them out the steamer, put them onto one form to bend, take them off that form and then put them onto the glue form to, to right. for the lamination with the print with the idea being that everything gets glued on this form they're basically the same right. form but this yeah. form is used for gluing so they're all the same yeah put it onto laminate put it onto that form laminated take it off after about three hours because i mean that's about enough time for the glue to set up yeah and where the curve is now it's just a basic l shape where the curve is i can actually i'm watching it just open up pop it's yeah. just opening and opening and there's nothing I could do. So I quickly got it back onto the clamps and realized afterwards there's probably two things going on. The first is that there's a lot of forces there on, on one yeah. spot. So, you know, with, with most glues, you can, you can clamp them up, set them in place, release the clamps after an hour, but they're not putting any stress onto that joint. But also that wood is now such a high moisture content because it's been sitting in a steam box. Yeah, what, how, much, how long did you wait between the steaming and gluing up? It was a couple of hours. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah, which well, probably wasn't, wasn't. I would enough. typically leave it on the steam, like the mold, um, like at least overnight. Mm. And then what I, I think from memory what I did was separate the pieces yeah. because there's still moisture in between them and just kind of let them sit loosely on the mold um, and get try and get that moisture out from between them yeah um, you know the other thing interestingly though what if you had used like gorilla glue like polyurethane glue it would have been bloody awesome because it really likes the water yeah and the, the water acts as a catalyst and it would have been it would have made it quite a strong joint yeah so at that point those two forms that I'd made I'd I'd made them and all my my setup for them had been taken apart so I didn't want to risk making another form even though I'd make it close it'd be very close yeah. I didn't want to risk it so all I could do was wait do it do one every 24 hour cycles yeah right. so I put it in the clamps wait for it to dry the next day then do the steaming so for literally yeah. for 11 pieces for the last 11 12 days <laughs> I've been coming down to the workshop putting in the steamer you know um, taking the the other bend off, putting it into yeah. that that's been my life for the last the last two weeks. I can't wait to actually do some woodworking and, yeah. and not just bending and gluing bits of timber together. So I'm a bit curious as to your next step. Mm. Um, so you're gonna have you've got all these kind of L shaped curvy bits yeah. that you would sit on and then you're gonna stack them next to each other to make the seat wide enough. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan there? You're just gonna like glue one a day there? 
onto the next one or are you going to try and glue multiple ones or like dowel them together to stop them from like coming out of alignment or something so they're going to have spaces between them so ah, they're not okay. going to be glued next so, you, so you're going to put like a bolt through them or something I'm, I'm hoping to be able to just get away with glue for this the, the next step okay. is going to be to I've got to I've got to flatten them and mill them all to the same size so that'll probably be on a router sled um, get right. them all down to roughly the same size so they've got nice edges because at the moment they're all over the place then what I'm thinking is I'll take a strip and cut some notches the width of the, the slats with, a, with say a five mil gap in between each one. So it's a strip so that the, the slats can sit into that and then that's gonna right. determine how far apart they are. And then those strips will then, so that strip will get glued onto the slats and then that strip will get glued onto the rails of the chair. Right. So that's, right. that's the theory. Of, that's where I cool. see it going. But um, I haven't started, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so you just said you're thinking about... So when you've laminated all these curvy bits, mm. the veneers move around a bit, and so you've got an inconsistent width. Yeah. And um, so you were just saying maybe using a router sled to, flat, or to flatten it off. Yeah. That seems like maybe not slow because it's not very wide. My initial idea, though, would be to run one side over your jointer, flatten it off, That's it, it, and then just and then mm. just run it through the bandsaw to cut it to width. Interesting. I hadn't thought fence. about the jointer. So I kind of did that on the other one. So on, on the legs, which are much thicker, chunkier pieces, right. flattened them using a router jig. Then the other side, I ran them through the thickness, and that worked a treat. That worked really well. My concern, though, with the thinner ones for the thickness or the jointer is there's still a bit of flex on them. So I'm wondering running them over the jointer if I'm going to be able to keep them A, from flexing and B, at that 90 degree, you know, to give it a 90 yeah. degree square uh, edge. That would be the trickiest part. It depends how 90 you want. Yeah, I guess I don't, <laughs> like, it doesn't need Does to. it matter if it's 90 or 91? Yeah. That's a good or idea, actually. I might even... I <laughs> it might even seems really it. quick. <laughs> That's a really good idea. I might give that a give that a think because you're right. Because I've got to do each one individually, and while they are thin, it's still, you know, it's it's a it's a bit of a pain in the ass yeah. job having to to do all those strips. Mm. I mean, you still you would still have to clean up the bandsaw edge, but you could then just throw that back on the jointer and and oversize them on the bandsaw by yep. a couple of mil, and then finish them down on the jointer. Yeah, um, the, the nice thing is I can just they can be whatever size they want. You know, yeah. that will just determine the next step. So, right, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it seems like a cool idea. But yeah, um, slats, man. Yeah. And, they, and they're all, you, you, because of the steaming and the laminating process, they're all slightly different. None of them are exact. So, yeah, right. that step where it comes to, to attaching them to the actual rails of the chair, I, I was saying to, to Brian and before the show, because this is all something I've never done before, I've never done steam bending, I've never done glue lambs, or you know, yeah. bend lambs, I've never made a chair. This is, like, it's all new. I am just... <laughs> Get them all into one project. <laughs> <laughs> I am just crossing fingers that all those slats are going to line up and they're not all at different heights and angles and, you, you know, it should be fine, yeah. but it's, it's that all done. It should be pretty good. Yeah. You could probably, I mean, even if some of them are slightly out, it's just about selecting the order, really, isn't it? And just graduating mm -hmm. out any mistake, like if there's any yeah. that sort of tilt slightly more than the other. Yeah. Be That's right. when it becomes an art piece, when it goes from one shape at one end and it morphs to another <laughs> shape at the other end. <laughs> Adding character, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, that's all going on. Um, I've got, got it all on my Instagram, so if anyone's interested, um, you can pick it up there. Um, all right, so I guess that, that's going to bring us to the end of the show. Um, was there anything else you guys wanted to mention before? Actually, there is one thing I wanted to ask. Uh, Brian, the, um, the, what we talked about last week, that initiative, how's that going? Oh, yeah. Oh, the tree maker, yeah. So I finally I got a bit of time and gave it a name and started the web page. Mm. And I've had a pretty good response so far. There's about 20 that have committed already to it. Awesome. Um, Americans, I just, I just did it right before the show. Good man, good man. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really good. It's been a uh, good response, and be great just to keep it keep it growing. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. 
Awesome. Yeah, and if anybody has any any uh, particular tree planting schemes that I've had some people DM me and I've added them to the list, but if you have any particular ones that you've found that might be useful, just message me um, via my Instagram or my email and I'll add them onto the list so that other people can see them and donate to them. Yeah, cool. That sounds good. Hmm. All right, everyone. Um, we're going to leave it there. So to everyone listening, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please go ahead and give it a rating on iTunes. That really does help us out. The Shop Store Podcast is available on iTunes and most other podcast apps as well as YouTube. My name is Robin Lewis. Joey and Brian, thanks for hanging out today. Take care, everyone, and we will see you on the next show.